One of the first things that Nicholas Wright and I came up with, and it's actually more, more Nick's um, invention, was that the way that we were going to get away with having arias that didn't feel like they were stopping action was to have these things called links that, that join one scene to another, like a sort of, a sort of joint, basically. And that each one was going to have its own distinct musical identity, um, but that it was going to focus in on another element of her character that, and deliver us from one scene to another. So that it's, it's not scene change music, but it's, it's sort of arias with a, with a, a thrust. Um, and so in Act One, for instance, there are four of them and they each have their own kind of, so the first one is this really jagged, like, um, brass, kind of ag aggressive information. She's talking about um, getting out of one town and moving to another, and it's her, basically. It's, I, I was conceiving of it as packing your bag really quickly, like trying to, trying to get out of town. Um, and then a, a little bit later, uh, she is at a bar, and she gets recognized by someone, and kind of pushes him away, and then has a moment where she thinks about kind of anonymity and how you can be anyone. And she says, if you're having a drink with your friends in, in the bar, are you the same person as you are at home? Are you the same person that you are at, at school or whatever? And, and so it's against this drone, these, just these three notes or two pitches that last for about a minute, and she... So there's a sense that these notes are the constant, and then if you put that out against it, it's like this, or if you put... That. So there's a sense of, of shining different lights on the same on the same object, um, and then there's one that that towards the end of the act when she gets kind of caught, and at that point she occupies the entire middle register of of her voice, and the orchestra is just up here. So it's we have two contrapuntos and two piccolos that just make way for her. So it's this antagonistic um, set of sounds. So those were actually the, some of the first things that I wrote because uh, I knew that all the music on either side of it had to relate in some way to that. One of the big pieces of architecture um, that happens in the story and in the libretto and, and I hope in the music is that you know, this is a woman who exists in fragments and she has all these different identities that, that are not just cosmetic, right? She herself has to play a part in each one, and she creates all these different characters. In that sense, she's sort of like an opera composer. <laughs> you know, she, she's the authoress of these, of all these different kind of three-dimensional um, characters. But whenever she's addressing us, we realize that it's her speaking as her, and these, these are the, the links. Um, but when she sings those links, all the, all the intervals that she th sings are like, kind of scattered around and, and uh, you know, difficult to learn, you know. They, they make sense harmonically, but it's, it's, all, it's all very jagged, right? And if you, if you drew the line, it would look kind of like this. And then at the end, when she has this revelation that it was mom's fault all along, um, the, the way that I dealt with that was by completely divorcing her from that, that kind of intervallic content. So, um, you know, at the ends, her just lines are almost more, more traditional. And my, the pathway towards that was that when she realizes that it was her mother's fault, all of her kind of gnarly music that kind of does that is answered in exact negative um, by the hymn, uh, Praise Muscle, the King of Heaven, whose refrain goes, uh, in my harmonization. So it's just scales. And that, that, then we do that, opened up this, it's basically that. Um, which sounds sort of like a cheap ending, but it, I, th I, think it, I think it works. So one of the difficulties about the character of Mark is that um, he is clearly um, a, sort of a sexual aggressor and he sexually assaults her at the end of Act One. And the, the, the trick about it is, is, to, is to keep him on stage in a nuanced way and not say this is an absolute villain and monster but also to, to always acknowledge that, that everything has changed after that point, that, that you can never really see anyone in the same way. Um, so we had this kind of beautiful um, 
I, Nick gave me a beautiful text, in, in, so this is sort of a few weeks after he assaults her and she tries to kill herself, but she's still married to him. Um, this, and the text is him trying to figure out some way to kind of lure her into some form of communication with him, some form of apology. And the, the, the text implies that he, go, he takes a walk out um, in the garden in the morning and he startles a deer and then he thinks of her as the deer and it's this kind of, kind of sappy thing. And what I, f what I thought I would do was write something very beautiful but without any bass in it. So there's no grounding to what he's saying. So the orchestra just does... It's not unbeautiful, but he sings. There's no reinforcement for him at all, right? Because the bad version is, you know, where it's it has that operatic kind of um, I don't want to say safety in it, but but it has a sense of of um, groundedness to it. So in this particular case, I thought what and, and it's vocally risky too is to make is to make the baritone the lowest voice that's happening. Everything else is like really pointillistic. There's no, I mean on a piano it sounds like I'm just playing, but it's like the strings divided up in this really specific way and and you know random bells in the middle of the bar <laughs>
<laughs> and, a, and a fox and you know in the, in the plot of the thing it's it's a pivotal uh, changing point and you can't not have it there's no other way to do it um, because it, it links up her relationship with her horse which is the most important one in her life with her relationship to um, feeling pursued so she starts to identify with the fox even though she's on a horse who's an element of such a pursuit with her anxiety with blood and so everything kind of everything kind of comes together in that moment and it was an unavoidable thing um, and so we were in denial about it for a couple of years and <clears throat> But one of the things that Julian and Mark came up with quickly is that this idea that the set had to be made of these floating panels that could move quickly and could receive projection that would change. So technically, it's it's really um, it's really interesting to have had that conversation so early in the process because it freed me up a little bit um, to work entirely abstractly in terms of what's happening. So. Even though I don't always do that, what happens is that the chorus sings these, um, a selection of texts without any rhythm, as in they can do them in their own free time as long as they outline these big chords. So you. going up and then once the whole perspective changes and she and she's kind of underneath the hooves it does a, it's sort of the opposite so, <laughs> big descending motifs and and so and then in between those things she directs she talks to us again and says you know um, she talk actually she addresses the fox in a weird way and she says you know run for your life get out of here uh, so the, so the hunt was, I think, for me, the most, the most challenging compositionally. But the weirdest thing about it is that once I wrote it, we never changed it. It actually, unlike, unlike a lot of the other stuff, when, you know, when we did a sing through, you think, oh, well, this could be short, you know, whatever. The fox, has, the fox hunt has remained almost identical since 2015. In the, in the two previous operas I'd written, um, there were very few sort of traditional arias that are, that are standalone. And that I think was frustrating um, to me in a weird way, but it was also how I, how I felt that the, the drama of those pieces needed to work. So in this particular case, I, I did have a, a few moments and where, where Nick and I agreed that there could be a, 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 a moment, not of her being aggressive and, and, and moving through us like a shark, but where she actually has a moment of repose. And there's only one of them really, which is when she's talking about her horse, which is sort of the whole point. And, I, we, we stuck it right before the fox hunt, which is the most terrifying you know, thing compositionally and also visually, and right after this, this um, garden party gone wrong. So the garden party gone, gone wrong starts very pleasant, and, and the chorus is almost, you know, just, it, it sound, it's incredibly old fashioned, everyone's in ball guns, and then it ends with this enormous fight between the two brothers and people coming in, and, and there's this random aria from the mother, and it's, it's all kind of chaos. And then out of that, the kind of dust clears, and we have the things happen, and projection happens. And then we're in this totally neutral. Um, and it's, it's a sense like the palate is cleansed, and she sings about how much she, she loves her horse. In the middle of that, we have a sense of clouds coming over it. She, again, these big registral extremes. He's, where she's saying, I know he'll never hurt me. I'll know he'll never disappoint me. Big descending things. And that they're meant to give her, her a certain power there, right? Where she says, I am in control of this situation.